Chapter 22. This is AM and FM radio communications. Some of the objectives for the chapter are to discuss the history of radio wave receivers, describe the different types of waves, convert back and forth between frequency and wavelength, describe several different types of microphone, discuss amplitude modulation and frequency modulation, that is AM and FM, calculate the percent of modulation, list the components and explain the operation of an AM receiver and transmitter, list and the components and explain the operation of a FM receiver and transmitter. List the components and explain the operation of a super heterodyne receiver. Receive the or describe the use of transducers in radio wave receivers. Some of the keywords in this chapter are amplitude modulation or AM, broadcast band, carrier wave, center frequency, continuous wave or CW, transmitter, demodulation, detection, frequency deviation, frequency modulation or FM, harmonic frequency, heterodyning, intermediate frequency or IF, low, lower sideband, modulation, radio wave selectivity, sensitivity, significant sideband, transducer, upper sideband and just to repeat the word <clears throat> the term is continuous wave transmitter that is CW for continuous wave transmitter you should look for these words and their definition throughout the reading I will not have those shown on the screen this chapter but you should listen and learn what their meaning is if not rewind and replay until you do. One of the greatest inventions of all time is the radio. Like many other inventions, the radio resulted from the work of many scientists. In 1864, James Maxwell theorized the, that electromagnetic waves existed. In 1887, Heinrich Rudolf Hertz confirmed this theory when he transmitted and received the first radio waves. The first continuous wave or CW transmitter was developed in 1897 by Guglielmo Marconi. That's Guglielmo Marconi. Two key devices that further the developments of the radio were the diode and the audion triode amplifier tube. Again, that's the audion triode amplifier tube. The diode was invented in 1904 by Alexander Fleming. The amplifier tube was patented in 1907 by Lee DeForest. A key scientist in radio history was Edwin H. Armstrong. He invented the regenerative ra radio circuit in 1913 and the super heterodyne radio circuit in 1918. Major Armstrong is also credited with the development of much of the FM radio theory. In this chapter, the interesting concepts behind the broadcasting of sound will be explored. The concepts taught in this unit lay the foundations of many of today's communication systems. Microwave transmission, satellite transmission, fiber optic systems, mobile telephones, electronic pagers, wireless computer modems and television are just a few of these systems. Many of the concepts and circuits explained in this section rely on concepts covered earlier in this text such as capacitance, inductance, RCL, that is resistive, capacitive and inductive circuits, semiconductors, transistors, amplifiers and transformers. It is advisable to review any or all of these chapters and systems if difficulty is encountered in this all-encompassing and important chapter. This chapter will also lay all the foundation of the text of the next chapter 
which is television, the all important television. 22.1 simple radio receiver. For a basic understanding of radio and television operations, we will first look at a simple radio receiver. This radio receiver consists of a few parts, an antenna, a ground, a tank circuit, a diode, a filter, and a speaker or set of headphones. Shown on your screen, 22-1, there are three radio stations, each broadcasting at different wavelengths. Each station is broadcasting a radio signal consisting of a carrier wave and an audio signal. Again, they consist of a carrier wave or CW and a, an audio signal. Station 1 is broadcasting an, at AM 920 or 920. Station 2 is at AM 1460 and station 3 at AM 1040. The radio waves of all three stations come in contact with their radio receiver antenna. The antenna converts the radio signals to alternating currents or AC which is conducted up and down the antenna to the ground. The antenna circuit is coupled to the tank circuit by mutual induction. The tank circuit consists of, a, of an inductor and a variable capacitor connected in parallel. Recall from chapter 16 that an inductor and a capacitor connected in parallel will have a resonant frequency. By using a variable capacitor you are able to vary the tank circuit resonant frequency until it matches the frequency of the desired station. For example, if we wish to tune in to station 1, the capacitor is varied until the resonant frequency of the tank circuit is equal to 920 kHz. Receiving a frequency of 920 kHz will cause the greatest voltage drop across the tank circuit. The other frequencies, the 1040, station 3, and 1460, station 2, will not produce a large voltage drop across the tank circuit. The detector rectifies the radio signal to a pulsing DC signal. The filter capacitor smooths the high frequency of the audio portion of the radio signal the detector diode and filter capacitor are necessary to change the broadcast frequency and audio signal to a reproducible sound at the headphones or speaker. The description above may sound simple and that is because it is the simple operation of a radio receiver. The radio described is known as a crystal radio receiver. When constructed properly in the lab, you can actually receive and hear a few stations. The performance of this radio, however, is extremely poor by today's standards. Today's radios and televisions operate from the same principles just described, but are a significantly refined version of the crystal set. In this chapter, you will see how a better radio is developed by amplifying or by applying more of the electronic concepts you have learned or read about thus far. Take special notes of the fact that there is no battery or other conventional power supply for this radio. First, we will discuss the power source for, for this radio. Radio waves. A radio wave is an electromagnetic radiation produced from currents alternating through an antenna. A transmitting antenna is surrounded by electromagnetic radiation. 
In chapter 9 in the study of electromagnetism, we learned that a conductor carrying an electric current is surrounded by a magnetic field. In a magnetic field created by an, by an alternating current, the field expands, collapses, and changes polarity in step with the frequency. Again, in a magnetic field created by an alternating current, that's AC, the field expands, collapses, and changes polarity in step with the frequency. In chapter 21, the oscillator was explained. An oscillator can produce high frequency alternating currents that produce a radio wave when connected to an antenna. In general, the radio wave is an electrostatic radiation of energy produced by an oscillator circuit. The electrostatic field is perpendicular to the electromagnetic field. Both travel away from the antenna. As a result, a radio wave is made up of electromagnetic and electrostatic fields. In figure 22-2, this is shown. The direction these waves radiate in respect to Earth is called polarization. In figure 22-3, in figure the waves are radiated from a vertical antenna. Note that the electrostatic or E waves are in the same plane as the antenna, yet perpendicular to direction of travel. The vertically polarized waves are perpendicular to the surface of the Earth. In figure 22-4 on the screen now, the wave is radiated from a horizontal antenna. It is still perpendicular to the direction of travel, but is parallel to the surface of the Earth. Generally speaking, the antenna that receives these waves should be positioned in the same way as the transmitting antenna. As, at high frequencies, the polarization changes slightly as the wave moves. Does all this mean the transmitting antenna radiates two waves? The answer is found on the fact, in the fact that without one, there cannot be another. Or without one, there cannot be the other. A moving electromagnetic or, or a moving electrostatic field, again, a moving electrostatic field produces a moving electromagnetic field. And likewise, a moving electromagnetic field produces a moving electrostatic field. These conditions exist whether an actual conductor is present or not. The radiated waves from an antenna can be divided into two groups. These are ground waves and sky waves. Ground waves. A ground wave follows the surface of the Earth to the radio receiver. The ground wave has three parts. The surface wave, the direct wave, which follows a direct path from the transmitter to the receiver, and the ground reflected wave, which strikes the ground and is then reflected to the receiver. The last two waves are combined and called a space wave. The waves that make up the space wave may or may not arrive at the receiver in proper order. They may join together or cancel each other depending on the distances traveled by each wave. Broadcast stations or broadcast stations depend on the surface wave for reliable communications. As the surface wave travels along the surface of the Earth, it induces currents in the Earth's surface. These currents use up the energy contained in the wave. The wave becomes weaker as the distance it travels increases. An interesting side note is that salt water conducts surface waves about 5,000 times better than land. Overseas communication is very reliable when transmitting 
support when transmitters are near the coastline. These stations use high power and operate at lower frequencies than the normal broadcast band. Sky waves. The second type of radiated wave is a sky wave. Sky waves use the ionized layer of the Earth's atmosphere for transmission. This layer is called the ionosphere. It is located about 40 to 300 miles above the Earth's surface. It is believed to consist of large numbers of positive and negative ions. As the sky wave radiates, it strikes the ionosphere. Some of the wave can be absorbed into the ionosphere, but some will bounce off the layer and be sent back to the Earth's surface. See figure 22-5. Jumping on to review questions for section 22.1. First, list the, the five main parts of a radio receiver and the function of each part. That is the antenna, the transistor, the speaker, the oscillator, the filter, etc. The antenna acts as a first contact with the radio waves transmitted by the transmitter or station. Uh, it receives basically the radio waves, all of them, all at the same time. It doesn't pick or choose any particular frequency. It just receives them all. Uh, since they are electromagnetic and electrostatic uh, waves all together, it has not the ability to uh, choose between any particular frequency or radio station. So that is why the transistor is needed. The antenna also acts as a converter. It converts the radio signal to alternating current. It receives the frequency, the radio waves, the electromagnetic and electrostatic waves, and tra transforms or converts this to AC. This is conducted up and down the antenna and the antenna is coupled to the tank circuit. This is done by mutual induction. Uh, again, the tank, the tank circuit is a inductor and a variable capacitor in parallel. Remember that uh, when you have a tank circuit, it does have a resonant frequency or a frequency at which it passes the most amount of amperage and by using the variable feature on the capacitor you are able to adjust at which frequency the most amperage is passed the most current is passed this is how you change the frequency or the radio station or the frequency at which the uh, amperage is passed. The detector rectifies the radio signal to a pulse and DC signal. That is the job of the detector and the filter capacitor smooths out the high frequency of the audio portion of the radio signal. The detector again uh, is a diode and a filter capacitor and these are necessary to change the broadcast frequency and the audio signal to a reproducible sound or a detectable sound at the headphones or speaker. And that is the simple basic explanation of the radio receiver operation and each of these parts here mentioned. Question two, what is polarization? It is the orientation of radio frequency waves in relation to the earth poles. Question three, list three parts of a ground wave.
and they are the surface wave, the direct wave, no, excuse me, the parts of the ground wave, yes, are the surface wave, the direct wave, and the ground reflected wave. And question four, a space wave is a combination of only the direct wave and the ground reflected wave. twenty two dot two frequency and wavelength. Think of radio wave moving uh, again think of a radio wave moving through space as a wave on a pond rolling
The mathematical relationship of frequency and wavelength shown on the screen left side of the formula where lambda is the wavelength given in miles V is the velocity of the wave in this case in the screen is C is the velocity of the wave given in miles per second which is in this case the speed of light and V is the frequent uh, the frequency given in Hertz again in this case the one we have shown the one on the text is slightly different but the one we have shown shows where lambda is the wavelength given in miles C is the velocity of the wave sometimes given as V but in this case in that the one on the left is C which is the velocity in miles per second in this case the speed, of light, the speed of light and V in that this case on the left side is the frequency given in Hertz the text uses again C for velocity and F for frequency so again we have to solve uh, for frequency the equation is rearranged and that is given at the bottom left of the screen when using metric, metric measurements the formula is written as on the right side top of the screen we have frequency equals to 300 million meters per second divided by lambda which is the wavelength for example an amateur radio broadcaster transmits a frequency of 3.9 megahertz what is the wavelength of the radiated waves in this case the wavelength equals to 186,000 miles per second divided by 3.9 megahertz first we convert 3.9 megahertz to 3,900,000 hertz into single units then we proceed to divide 186,000 miles per second divided by 3,900,000 Hertz and you can observe how the math is simplified by using the powers of 10 around the middle of the right side of the screen right now and we ultimately get more or less 0 0.05 miles another example what is the frequency of a transmitter operating at 40 meters these are metric measurements or SI system international uh, measurements so we have a uh, frequency in this case F equals to 3 times the 10 to the power uh, to the 8th power or to the power of 8 meters per second and you divide that by 4 times 10 meters and as you can see toward the bottom part of the right side of the screen we ultimately get 7.5 megahertz a more useful form of this formula is also available since foot is the common unit of measure in radio frequencies they are usually in megahertz and the formula is at the bottom of the right side of the screen where lambda equals to 984 divided by the frequency memorize these formula if possible they are used a great deal in the design of special frequency antennas the antenna absorbs most of the radio wave when it matches the length of the radio wave
The frequency spectrum. Electromagnetic waves are produced at many different frequencies. Since the frequencies of radio transmitters could interfere with each other, a system of regulating the use of transmitters had to be developed. This system ensures an orderly use of the airwaves. See figure 22-8. This system is known as a frequency spectrum. This chart shows the frequency bands used by telecommunication areas such as radio, television, satellite, transmission, aviation, radar, police, and many more. The use of frequencies is strictly controlled. This is because there are many users of these systems and each user requires a frequency on which to broadcast. Since there is only a limited number of frequencies available, the frequencies must be assigned to meet the needs of the public. At the same time, there must be a minimum of interference between the services. The Federal Communication Commission, or FCC, controls frequency assignment in the United States. The waves are also grouped according to frequency. Figure 22-9. Note the location of some services. AM broadcast stations use the MF range, that is modulated frequency. The television uses the VHF and UHF ranges. A stereo receiver operates in the audio frequency range. Electricity for the home is 60 Hertz. It operates at the audio frequency. Review questions for section 22.2. 1. At what speed does a radio wave travel, that is at the speed of light, or 300 million meters per second? 2. Wavelength can be determined by dividing the wave speed, wave speed V or of the wave by the wavelength, excuse me, or by the frequency, or F, of the wave. The wavelength for a 93 megahertz signal is how many meters? For this you use the equation lambda equals to velocity divided by frequency in this case 300 uh, 300 million divided by 93 million Hertz so we get 300 million divided 93 million doing it in the calculator as, as I speak we get 3.22 and that is the size of the wavelength and that is in meters so 3.22 meters number four what is the length of a 1040 or a 1040 a.m. radio wave So 1040 is actually 10,040 kilohertz or thousands hertz or uh, 1040 thousand hertz. So that translate to about 1 million hertz or 1 megahertz. So all we have to do in this case is uh, divide again the velocity which is the speed of light or 300 million divided by ten forty mega or ten ten forty a thousand and forty millions Excuse me, we just divide 300 million, that is the speed, divided by 1040,000, that is the equivalent of 1 million 
and forty thousand. So one million and forty thousand. Divide that and you get two hundred and eighty eight point four six meters. That is the size of a AM ten forty radio wave. Quite large. That's why it travels such a long distance. Number five, why are transmitted electromagnetic signals controlled by the FCC? That is because of the limited wave frequencies and to keep, uh, keep order and uh, a little bit of fairness as far as the use, not so much fairness, but to keep the radio uh, from uh, the frequencies, radio frequencies from being basically overloaded and disorderly used. Six radio waves are grouped according to their fill in the blank frequency. Seven, the audio or human hearing range lies between fill in the blanks 20 hertz and 30 kilohertz. Eight, what are the frequencies of the following telecommunication systems? And the ones needed are A through F. So we fill in the blank. First one is AM radio. AM radio is from, it varies from country to country, but in the United States is from three, uh, 535 to about 1605 kilohertz. Or from 535 hertz to 16 05 kilohertz no excuse me 535 kilohertz to 1605 kilohertz cb radio the range for that is as follows that is from 26.96 to 27.41 megahertz tv channels two through four that is the old analog television frequency now that may have changed with HDTV that began in the mid 2000s TV channels from 2 to 4 are from 54 megahertz to 72 megahertz television channels from 6 through uh, excuse me from 5 through 6 are from 76 megahertz to 88 megahertz and television channels 14 through 83 are from a block diagram of a simple continuous wave CW transmitter is shown in figure 22-10. The first block, block is the conventional crystal oscillator and then the final power amplifier. A power supply is provided for the oscillator and the final power amplifier. Following the action in figure 22-10. 
22-10. The oscillator creates an AC sine wave at the desired frequency. This signal is called the carrier wave. The carrier wave or carrier wave is then amplified by the radio frequency RF power amplifier to the desired output wattage. A power supply is required to provide the voltage or the voltages and current needed to operate the oscillator and the RF power amplifier. The output is then fed to an antenna. From there, the energy is sent into the air as an electromagnetic wave or waves. Notice that a CW transmitter sends energy that has no audio or video message. The CW or carrier wave transmitter has only two states on or off. How can this type of transmitter be useful? By adding a switch. The transmitter can be turned off and on following a code. For example, such is such as such a transmission could be used to send Morse code messages. This is seen in figure 11, uh, 22 11. 22 12 lists the character set for sending Morse code messages. The basic switched or keyed CW transmitter can be improved by placing a buffer amplifier between the oscillator and the RF amplifier. The buffer amplifier isolates the oscillator from the RF amplifier and keeps it from shifting off to the desired frequency. It also provides some amplification to the carrier waves or to the carrier wave. Many CW transmitters use frequency multipliers to increase the frequency produced by the basic oscillator. These circuits multiply the carrier wave by two, a doubler, or three, a tripler. These circuits operate on the principle of harmonics in the fundamental carrier frequency created by the oscillator. A fundamental frequency is the basic frequency produced by the oscillator. A harmonic frequency is a multiple of the fundamental frequency. Microphones. How is a sound wave converted to an electrical wave? Your vocal cords send vibrations in the air. These waves move out to all persons within hearing range. A microphone will convert these sound waves to electrical audio waves on the same frequency and relative amplitude. Microphones are sometimes called transducers. This is because they transform one form of energy, vibrating air, or mechanical to electrical energy. Figure 22-13 on top shows a microphone built into a video camera. Twenty-two-dash fourteen shows a diagram of a carbon microphone that is shown on the bottom of the screen. Granules of carbon are packed in a small container. Electrical connections are made to each side a transformer and a small battery are joined in series with the carbon. A diaphragm is attached to one side of the container. This diaphragm is called a button. Sometimes it's called a button. Sound waves strike a diaphragm button and cause the carbon granules to be compressed or pushed together. This varies the resistance of the carbon, varying resistance causes a varying current to flow through the carbon button and the transformer primary. The output is a current that varies at the same frequency as sounds or the sound waves acting on the diagram. diagram. The carbon microphone is very sensitive, a very sensitive device. It has a frequency response up to about 4000 Hertz. This is useful for voice communication but not for reproduction of music. It provides a good response for its intended frequencies. A, a carbon mono, uh, microphone non, is non-directional, 
which means it will pick up sound from all direction. Crystal microphone. A second type of microphone uses a piezoelectric effect to, of certain crystals. It is called a crystal microphone. When sound waves strike a diaphragm, mechanical pressure is transferred to the crystal. The flexing or bending of the crystal creates a small voltage between its surfaces. The voltage is the free, the same uh, the voltage is the same frequency and relative amplitude as the sine wa sound wave, figure 22-15. Crystal microphones have a frequency response up to 10,000 hertz. They are sensitive to shock and vibration. They should be handled with care. The dynamic microphone. A dynamic microphone or moving coil microphone is sketched in figure 22-16. As sound waves strike the diaphragm, they cause the voice coil to move in and out. The voice coil is surrounded by a fixed magnetic field. When the coil moves, a voltage is induced in the coil. Faraday's discovery. This induced voltage causes the current to flow at a frequency and amplitude similar to the sound wave causing the motion. It has a frequency response of up to 9000 Hz. It is directional and requires no outside voltage for operation. The condenser microphone. The condenser microphone operates on the principle of capacitance. It is similar in construction to a capacitor consisting of two plates separated by air. One plate is rigid while the other is movable. As sound waves strike the movable plate, the distance between the two plates will vary, varying the capacitance of the microphone. The varying capacitance of the microphone causes a reproduction of the audio signal similar in frequency and amplitude. The condenser microphone is very sensitive when compared to other types of microphones. The velocity microphone. A high quality microphone called a velocity microphone is made by suspending a corrugated ribbon of metal in a magnetic field. Sound waves directly striking the ribbon cause the ribbon to vibrate. As the ribbon cuts the magnetic field, a voltage is induced. Proper connections at the ends of the ribbon bring the voltage out to terminals. This voltage varies according to the frequency and amplitude of the incoming sound waves. The velocity microphone is a somewhat delicate microphone with a response above 12,000 Hertz. When using this microphone, the speaker must speak across its face or stand about 18 inches away, otherwise a booming effect is created. Modulation. When you turn on the radio or TV, you expect to hear music or voices you understand. The signals of the CW or the carrier wave transmitter means nothing to the average person. To make an understandable message, the, an audio wave is combined or superimposed on a carrier wave or CW. See figure 22-17. The process of combining an audio wave with a carrier wave is called modulation. Sound waves are converted by microphones into electrical waves amplified and then combined with the CW radio wave. Amplitude modulation. Amplitude modulation occurs when the amplitude of the CW radio wave is made to vary at an audio frequency rate. Amplitude modulation is referred to as AM. In a second method, the radio wave frequency is made to vary at an audio frequency rate. This is called the frequency modulation or FM. Part A shows the modulation of the amplitude of a carrier wave.
part B shows the modulation of the frequency of a carrier wave. Review questions, sections 22.3. One, sketch a carbon microphone. That is shown on the screen. Two, what is a fundamental frequency and what is a harmonic frequency? For a fundamental frequency, the basic frequency is produced by an oscillator. And for a harmonic frequency, multiple is a multiple of the fundamental frequency. Three, combining a continuous wave with an audio wave is called modulation. Twenty two dot four amplitude modulation or AM. Modulation is a process in which an audio wave is combined or superimposed on a carrier wave. Assume a radio transmitter is operating at a frequency of 1000 kHz. A musical tone of 1000 Hz is to be used for modulation. Refer to figure 22-18. Using a modulation circuit, the amplitude of the carrier wave is made to vary at, a, at the audio rate, uh, signal rates. Again, using modulation, a modulation circuit, the amplitude of the carrier wave is made to vary at the audio signal rate. Let's look at this process another way. Mixing a 1000 Hz wave with a 1000 kHz wave produces a sum wave and a difference wave, which are also in the radio frequency range. These two waves will be 1001 kHz and 999 kHz. They are known as sideband frequencies the upper sideband is the higher number and the lower sideband is the lower number for this say figure 22-19 the sum of the carrier wave and its sidebands is an amplitude modulated wave the audio tone is present in both sidebands as either sideband results from modulating at 1000 kilohertz signal with a 1000 hertz tone. The location of the waves on a frequency base are shown in figure 22-20, that's at the bottom left of the screen. If a 2000 hertz tone was used for modulation, the, then the sidebars or the, sa the sidebands would appear at 900 and 998 kHz and 1002 kHz. In order to transmit at 5000 Hz tone, again in order to transmit a 5000 Hz tone of a violin using AM sidebands of 995 kHz and 10, uh, 1005 kHz would be required. The frequency bandwidth to transmit the 5000 Hz musical tone will be 10 kHz. There is not enough space in the spectrum for all broadcasters to transmit, and if all broadcasts contained the same message or operated on the same frequency, the effect would be confusing. Therefore, the broadcast band for AM radio extends from 535 kHz to 1605 kHz. This is divided into 106 channels, each 10 kHz wide. Each radio station is in, excuse me, each radio station in a geographic area is licensed to operate at a frequency in one of these 106 channels. The channels are spaced far enough from each other to prevent interference. In order to improve the fidelity and quality of music within these limitations, a vestigial sideband filter is used. A vestigial sideband filter removes a large portion of the sideband or removes a large portion of one sideband. Recall that both sidebands contain the same information. 
This wave frequencies higher than 5 kilohertz can be used for modulation and the fidelity is improved. Modulation patterns. A radio transmitter is not permitted by law to exceed 100% modulation. This means that the modulation signal cannot cause the carrier signal to vary over 100% of its unmodulated value. Look at the patterns in figure 22-21. Notice the amplitude of the modulated waves. The 100% modulation wave variation is from 0 to 2 times the peak value of the carrier wave. Over modulation is caused when modulation increases the carrier wave to over 2 times its peak value. At negative peaks the waves cancel each other and leave a straight line to a 0 value. Overmodulation causes distortion and interference called splatter. The percent of modulation can be computed using the formula shown on the right side of the screen. Percentage of modulation equals to E max minus E minus divided by 2EC times 100, where E max is the maximum amplitude of modulated wave, E minimum is the minimum amplitude of modulated wave and EC is the amplitude of unmodulated wave. Sideband power. The DC input power to the final amplifier of a transmitter is the product of voltage and current. To find the power required by a modulator, the following formula can be used where P is or P audio is the power of the modulator, M is the percentage of modulation expressed in a, as a decimal, and P DC is the input power of, uh, to the final amplifier. As an example, what power is required to modulate a transmitter having a DC power input of 500 watts to 100%? Following the formula, we can get ultimately 250 watts. This represents a total input power of 750 watts or 250 watts plus 500, 500 watts. Notice what happens under the 50% modulation. We get ultimately 62.5 watts. The total input power is only six, uh, 562 0.5 watts or 62.5 watts plus 500 watts where the modulation percentage is reduced to 500% the power is reduced to 25%. This is a severe drop in power that decreases the broadcasting range of the transmitter. It is wise to maintain transmitted modulation close to but not exceeding 100%. The term input power has been used because any final amplifier is far from 100% efficient. In the formula, percent efficiency equals to P out divided by P in times 100. If a power amplifier has had a 60% efficiency and a PDC input of 500 watts, its output power would approach the P out equals to a percent of efficiency times PN equals to 0.6 in this case times 100 times 500 watts which equals to 300 watts. A transmitter has 100% modulation and power of 750 watts. 500 watts of this power is in the carrier wave and 250 watts is added to produce the sidebands. Therefore, there are 125 watts of power in each sideband, or one sixth of the total power in each sideband. Recall that each sideband contains the same information 
and each is a radio frequency wave that will radiate as well as the carrier wave so why waste all this power in single sideband transmission this power is saved the carrier and one side and one sideband are suppressed only one sideband is radiated at the receiver end the carrier is put back in the difference signal the audio signal is then detected and reprodu reproduced we will not cover the methods of sideband transmission and reception but you may wish to study this communication system on your own review questions for section 22.4 define modulation and it is when an audio or other wave is added to a carrier wave or CW 2 when the sum of the carrier wave and its sidebands results in the amplitude modulated wave or AM that was a fill in the blank question 3 a carrier wave has a peak value of 500 volts a modulating signal causes an amplitude variation from 250 volts to 750 volts then what is the percent of modulation so using the formula percent modulation equals to e max minus e mi minimum divided by 2 ec times 100 we get the percent of modulation in this case we have a variation of Emax of 750 volts and that is minus the minimum of 250 volts that's the E minimum or voltage minimum we get 500 volts in this case and we have to divide that by the E2 uh, times EC where EC is the amplitude of modulated unmodulated wave Twenty two dot five frequency modulation or FM in frequency modulation a constant amplitude continuous wave the radio wave is made to vary frequency at the audio frequency rate figure 22-22 FM radio is a popular method of electronic communication 
Frequency modulation allows a high audio sound to be transmitted while still remaining within the space legally assigned to the broadcast station. Also, FM transmits dual channels of sound stereo by multiplex systems. The FM band is from 88 megahertz to 108 megahertz. A block diagram of a FM transmitter is shown in figure 22-20. Top of the screen. Each FM station is assigned a center frequency in the FM band. This is the frequency to which a radio is tuned. Figure 22-24. The amount of frequency variation from each side of the center frequency is called the frequency deviation. Frequency deviation is set by the amplitude or strength of the audio modulating wave. In part A of figure 22-24, a weak audio signal causes the frequency in the carrier wave to vary between 101 megahertz and 99.99 megahertz. The deviation is plus or minus 10 kilohertz. In part B of the figure, a stronger audio signal causes a frequency swing between 105 megahertz to 99.95 megahertz, or a deviation of plus or minus 50 kilohertz. The stronger modulation signal, the greater again the stronger the modulation signal the greater the frequency departure and the more the band is filled. The rate of frequency deviation depends on the frequency of the audio modulating signal. For this see figure 22-25 at the bottom. If the audio signal is 1000 Hz the carrier wave goes through its greatest deviation or 1000 times per second. If the audio signal is 100 Hz, the frequency changes at a rate of 100 times per second. Notice that the modulating frequency does not change the amplitude or of the carrier wave. An AEM, excuse me, an FM signal forms sidebands. Again, an FM signal forms sidebands. The number of sidebands produced depends on the frequency and amplitude of the modulating signal. Each sideband is separated from the center frequency by the amount of frequency or by the amount of the frequency of the modulating signal. Narrow band FM. Maximum deviation of a carrier wave can be limited so that the FM wave occupies the same space as an AM wave carrying the same message. This is called narrow wave or narrow band FM. Some distortion occurs in the received signal. This is satisfactory for voice communication, but not for quality sound music sound systems. The modulation index. The modulation index is the relationship between the maximum carrier deviation and the maximum modulating frequency. The modulating frequency or the modulate, modulation index has an equation which could be written as modulation index equals to maximum carrier deviation divided by maximum modulating frequency. Using this index, the number of significant sidebands and the bandwidth of the FM signal can be figured. The complete index can be found in more advanced texts Examples of the use of modulation of the modulation index are given in figure 22-27. The if the amplitude of a modulating signal caused a maximum deviation of 10 kilohertz and the frequency of the modulating signal was 1000 hertz, the index would be modulation index equals to 10,000 divided by 1000 or 10. If you examine 
figure 22-27, you can see that this FM signal would have a would have 14 significant sidebands and occupy a bandwidth of 28 kilohertz. Percent of modulation. The percent of modulation has been set at a maximum deviation of plus or minus 75 kilohertz for FM radio. The FM sound transmission in television is limited to plus or minus 25 kilohertz. Moving on to the review questions for section 22.5. One, the center frequency is the frequency to which radio is tuned. Question two, define frequency deviation. And it's the amount of frequency variation from each side of the center frequency. Question three, on what does the rate of frequency deviation depend? The frequency of the audio modulating signal. Number four, A or N, fill in the blank. And the answer is a significant side band has an amplitude of at least 1% of the unmodulated carrier. And question five, how is the modulation index found for FM sound? And that is using the formula. Modulation index equals to maximum carry deviation divided by maximum modulating frequency. Twenty two dot six AM receiver. A radio wave transmitted through space carries audio information, such as voices and music. This information has been combined with a with the carrier wave, the CW, at the transmitter by the amplitude modulation process. These radiated radiated electromagnetic waves cut across and induce a small voltage in the receiving antenna. The small radio frequency voltages are coupled to a tuned circuit in the receiver, which selects the signal to be heard. After the selection, the voltages can be amplified, then modulated, then demodulated. Demodulation or detection is the process of removing the audio portion of a signal from the carrier wave. It is a form of rectification. The audio signal is then amplified until it can drive an audio speaker. A block diagram of this receiver is shown in figure 22-28. The modulated RF wave is shown as it passes the antenna. The audio wave is shown as the outputs of the detector. The increase in amplitude between the blocks is the result of the ampli amplification stages. This type of receiver was once quite popular. It was called the Tuned Radio Frequency or TRF receiver. For satisfactory operation of the circuit, each stage had to be tuned to the correct incoming frequency. Some early radios had a series of tuning dials on the front panel. Adjusting these to receive a signal required skill and patience. The development of the super heterodyne receiver overcame these obstacles. The tuning circuit. One function of any radio receiver is selection of the desired radio signal. Figure 22-29 shows a schematic of the first stage of the TRF receiver, that's the tuned radio frequency receiver. Follow the signals or the signal of the antenna to the output of this circuit of this circuit. Radio signals of many frequencies from many radio stations or many transmitters pass by the antenna. The induced voltage in the antenna causes small currents to alternate from antenna to ground and from ground to antenna through coil L1. 
The magnetic field created by the antenna current in L1 transfers energy to L2. The combination coils L1 and L2 are called the antenna coil. Examples of course are drawn in figure 22-30. A tank circuit is formed from L2 and variable capacitor C1. The resonance of the tank circuit is changed by adjusting C1. When the resonant frequency of the tank circuit is the same as the incoming signal, high circulating currents develop in the tank. In other words, the tank circuit can be adjusted to give peak response for only a single frequency. The L2C1 combination can cover only a certain range or band of frequencies. Most of our home radio or radios cover only the broadcast band. For other groups of frequencies such as short wave, that is lambda between 10 to 10 uh, to 100 meters, that is the wavelength between 10 and 10, uh, 100 meters, another coil is switched in place of L2. This coil changes the resonant frequency range of the circuit. This is called the band switching circuit. The ability of a radio receiver to select a single frequency is called selectivity. The ability of, the, of a receiver to respond to weak incoming signals is called sensitivity. Both of these traits are desirable. Special circuits and components have been devised to improve selectivity and sensitivity. RF amplification. The radio frequency amplifier is most often the first stage to receive the signal from the antenna. The RF amplifier is tuned to incoming signal's frequency. It amplifies the signal to provide gain. Generally, RF amplifiers are narrow band amplifiers that can amplify only the band of or frequencies to be picked up by that receiver. An example is the RF amplifier in an AM broadcast band receiver. It can amplify frequencies from 550 to 1500 kHz. An RF amplifier improves the selectivity of a, of a receiver. The schematic for an, R, for an RF amplifier is shown in figures in figure 22-31. The tuning circuit is made up of C1 and L2 formed into a tank circuit. The tuned signal is fed into the secondary winding of L2. The amplifier is the 2N1637 transistor. Some less costly radio receivers do not have RF amplifier stages. High quality radio receivers will often have two or, two or more RF amplifier stages. Detection. Detection is needed to recover the audio signal from the modulated RF carrier wave. Assume that a modulated radio frequency signal has been amplified by several stages of RF amplification. It now has enough amplitude for detection. Recall that detection is a form of rectification. The RF wave is removed leaving only the AF wave. See figure 22-32. The diode detector. One method of detection uses a diode as a unilateral or one direction conductor. When the anode of the diode is driven positive, electrons flow through the diode from the cathode to anode. The diode conducts. When the anode is driven negative, the diode does not conduct. Figure 22-33 shows the basic diode detector. 
the amplified modulated signal is supplied to the detector by the previous amplifier stage. When the input signal is positive, the diode conducts. A voltage develops across the diode load resistor R1. When the incoming signal is negative, there is no current in the diode circuit. The diode has rectified the modulated RF signal into pulses or waves of DC voltage. These waves have a frequency and amplitude of the audio wave. To understand the half wave rectification, look at the input and output waves forms in figure 22-34. The black curve is the in the outputs of the diode denotes the average DC value of the rectified voltage. Even through the signal, or even though the signal has been rectified, the frequency is still too high to convert to recognizable to a recognizable audio sound. The signal is rising and falling too fast for a speaker or headphone to convert. Raising the average DC output will cause it to more closely reproduce the original audio input signal. A filter capacitor of the correct value, C1, is shunted across R1. The capacitor charges, the, charges to the peak value of the signal and then slowly discharges slightly. The addition of the capacitor smooths the signal so that it will be changed to a recognizable audio similar to the original sound mixed with the carrier wave and transmitted. The improved output waveform resulting from the filtering is shown in figure 22-35. The time constant of R1C1 should be long when compared to the RF cycle and will deter C1 from discharging to a low value. Likewise, this, is const this time constant should be short when compared to the AF cycle. A properly selected R1C1 network will cause the voltage variations to follow the audio frequency cycle. Moving on to the review questions for section 22.6. One, define modulation. It is the removal of audio signals from the carrier wave. Question two, demodulation is a form of the correct answer is A, rectification. Question three, what was the drawback of the TRF receiver? And that is that fine tuning was required by using dials. Question four, the ability of a receiver to choose a single frequency is called selectivity. Question five, the ability of a receiver to respond to weak incoming signals is sensitivity. Question six, fill in the blank, RF amplifiers are narrow band amplifiers that can amplify only the band or frequencies picked up by that receiver. Twenty two dot seven the super heterodyne receiver. The super heterodyne receiver was developed as a solution to the problems of the TRF receiver. The term heterodyning means mixing of signals. Heterodyne converts all incoming signals to a single intermediate frequency. This signal can then be applied with little loss of or and distortion. See figure 22-36. The signal picked up by the antenna is fed first to a stage of radio frequency amplification or RF amp. The outputs of the RF amp is then fed to the mixer or converter stage. The output of a lo local oscillator is also fed to the converter. When two signals are mixed together, four signals appear in the output.
These signals include the two original signals, the RF signal and the signal from the local oscillator. The sum of the two signals and the difference between the two signals, for example, if a 1000 kilohertz signal is mixed with a 1455 kilohertz local oscillator signal appearing in the output is the 1000 kilohertz original signal, the 1455 kilohertz oscillator frequency, a 2455 kilohertz frequency sum, and a 455 kilohertz frequency difference. The beat frequency is the name given to the combination of the two frequencies. The beat frequency of 455 kHz is key to the study of the super heterodyne receiver. A radio station is selected using the tuning circuits of the receiver. Tuning the tuning knob or, or turning the tuning knob of the front panel varies the capacitance of the tuning circuit. Attached to shafts of the turning capacitor is another tuning capacitor that adjusts the frequency of the local oscillator. For this see figure 22-37. These capacitors operate in step with each other. They provide a change in oscillator frequency as the tuned frequency is changed. They always maintain a fixed difference or beat frequency of 455 kHz in this case. This frequency is called the intermediate frequency or IF. The IF output is then amplified by two stages of voltage amplification and fed to the detector. The detector output is an audio frequency voltage. It is amplified enough to operate the power amplifier and speaker. The waveform at each stage are shown in figure 22-36. An 8 transistor AM superheterodyne receiver is shown in figure 22-38. This circuit is part of the gray mark AM transistor radio. Each part of this super heterodyne receiver will be, will be discussed in detail. The mixer. The mixer or frequency converter performs three functions, figure 22-39. Mixing is just one of the functions. The mixer also converts the incoming signal to a new frequency called the intermediate frequency. This is done by mixing it with a signal produced by a local oscillator. At the same time, it provides amplification. The mixer is a nonlinear non circuit. Signals are combined to produce the sum and the difference frequencies of the original signals. The properties of a mixer can be used to produce a signal of the correct frequency for the IF amplifier. A signal must be produced locally within the receiver by an oscillator. This signal and the signal of, the, of interest are mixed. The original two signals, the sum signal and the difference signal appear at the output of the mixer. An example is shown in figure 22-40. Notice that the signals of many stations could be mixed to a new frequency. However, the IF amplifier will not amplify these because they are not within the IF passband. The local oscillator is designed to be 455 kHz above the desired signal. The incoming signal must pass through a tuned antenna circuit to get to the mixer. This is because there are two possible signals that can be mixed to result in the IF. One is the desired signal and the other is called an image. See figure 22-41.
images are suppressed in front of the mixer by the tuned antenna circuit. The more selectivity in front of the mixer, the less of a problem images will be. The incoming signal frequency, the local, local oscillator frequency, the sum and the difference of the two are presented in the inputs of the first IF amplifier. The IF amplifier is, is designed to amplify only the difference frequency, 455 kilohertz in this case. It will reject the other three frequencies because they all fall outside of the passband of the IF amplifier. The partial schematic shown in figure 22-39 is the mixer used in the receiver of figure 22-38. The input circuit is composed of tuning and trimmer capacitors C1A and coil L1 also serving as the antenna. This is a high Q resonant circuit. This is designed to select the incoming signal and to reject images. L1 has a winding joint to the antenna circuit by, a, by an inductive couple. This winding will couple the selected signal to the base of Q2. Bias current for Q2 is provided by R R1. C1 bypasses one end of the coupling winding to ground. The resonant circuit connected to the collector of Q2 is tuned to the immediate or intermediate frequency. The emitter resistor of Q2, R2, provides bias voltage. The Q2 emitter is the point at which the local oscillator output is put into the mixer. It moves through coupling capacitor C4. Mixer gain is controlled by automatic gain control or AGC feedback through the resistors R10 and R1. Local oscillator. Oscillator pulling is caused when the local oscillator is inserted as part of the mixer. There is also an increase in distortion products. Consequently, although it uses more components, a separate local oscillator creates a more stable design. Figure 22-42 shows a radio with a separate local oscillator. Transistor Q1 is connected as a variable oscillator. A variable capacitor C1B is mechanically coupled to the mixer input circuit. Capacitor C1B is coupled to the tuning capacitor C1A. The frequency of the signal made by the local oscillator will be adjusted to 455 kilohertz, higher than the receiver signal. The positive feedback needed for oscillation is returned to the Q1 emitter through C5. IF amplifiers. IF amplifiers set selectivity and pr provide most of the voltage gain in the super heterodyne circuit. IF amplifiers are non tunable except for alignment, radio frequency amplifiers. Because they amplify a fixed frequency, they can be quite useful. Gain and bandwidth can be tailored to meet the needs of the receiver. Some limits to this include 1. The lower the frequency, the easier it is to obtain a narrow bandwidth. 2. The IF frequency will set the image frequency. See mixer discussion. Thus, the IF frequency should be as high as practical. In AM broadcast rece receivers, 455 kHz has been chosen to be the best frequency. And the intermediate frequency is, if the intermediate frequency is lower, the image response would suffer. And if higher, it would be harder to reach the proper bandwidth with just two IF stages. A lower intermediate frequency permits more narrow bands or more narrow bandwidth because of arithmetic arithmetical selectivity. It explains the uh, to explain this concept, consider two signals, one at one megahertz and the other at 1.01 megahertz. 
the separation of these two signals is 10 kilohertz, which is a difference of 1%. But when both signals are converted to their intermediate frequencies in the mixer, the 1 megahertz signal becomes 455 kilohertz. The 1.01 megahertz signal becomes 465 kilohertz. The difference of 10 kilohertz is now 2.2%, or more than twice the percentage difference of the intermediate frequency. The signals can now be easily separated by the IF amplifier. The standard intermediate frequencies for receivers are, as seen on the left side of the screen, for AM receivers 455 kilohertz, FM receivers 10.7 megahertz, television receivers 41 to 46 megahertz. There are two IF amplifiers used in the AM receiver shown in figure 22-43. Two transistor stages and three resonant circuits are provided to achieve the gain and pass band required. Transistors Q3 and Q4 each amplify the IF signal. The transformers IFT1, figure 22-38, and IFT3, and their internal capacitors each have a narrow pass band. This keeps out unwanted frequencies. The transistor Q3 is connected to the output of the mixer transistor. Again, the transistor Q3 is connected to the output of the mixer transistor through a winding with an inductive coupling transformer IFT1. The operating bias of transistor Q3 is developed by resistor R5 and the emitter resistor R6. The bias current and thus the collector current are controlled by, a, by the AGC voltage. This voltage is developed at the outputs of the third IF transformer, IFT3. Each of three resonant circuits are located in the IF transformers. All are tuned user adjustable to 455 kHz. The intermediate frequency, which is the 455 kHz. The Q and coupling coefficient are designed to provide the proper bypass. These factors are crucial. They are an integral part of the design and are not adjustable. Gain, gain is fixed and maximized by proper biasing. The emitter resistor in RF bypassed is RF bypassed. If this was not done, the negative feedback developed across the emitter resistor would reduce the gain a great deal. The second IF stage is like the first IF stage. The gain is fixed and maximized by proper biasing with resistors R7 and R6. The emitter resistor is RF bypassed so that the negative feedback developed across the emitter resistor will not reduce the gain. Detector. The detector circuit shown in figure 22-44 is much the same as is used in a simple crystal receiver. However, because there are two stages of IF amplification before the detector and more gain is provided by the mixer stage, weak signals can be detected. The gain in front of the detector allows the signal to overcome the threshold voltage of the detector diode. The detector detects the modulation information from the received signal. This is done by rectifying the amplified signal, then filtering the remaining RF from the signal. The detector diode or D1 rectifies the RF modulated signal. Note that the envelope of the RF waveform contains the audio information first used to modulate the RF carrier at the transmitter. The RF is removed, bypassed to ground by C12. This occurs because the 
0.02 microfarad capacitor presents a low impedance path for the RF signal, but very high impedance for audio frequencies. Automatic gain control. Automatic gain control, AGC, keeps the audio output level constant despite the varying strengths of the signals. AGC rectifies and filters the outputs of the IF stages. This signal is used to control the gain of the preceding stages. In this manner, input signals with a strength difference of 40 decibels or dB can, can cause a little or can cause as little as 3 dB change in audio output level. Without AGC, the volume would have to be adjusted as each station was tuned in. AGC is also known as AVC, Automatic Volume Control. Refer to figure 22-44. The AGC voltage is taken from the junction of C12 and R10. Resistor R10 keeps the audio from the further filtering by C6. Figure 22-43. The AGC voltage appears across C6. This AGC voltage controls the current into the bases of Q2 and Q3. Figure 22-38. The gain of transistors Q2 and Q3 are directly proportional to their collector currents. Detector diode D1 is connected to supply a negative voltage that increases as signal strength increases. This negative voltage is applied to the basis of Q2 and Q3. It controls the gain. Therefore, as, a, as the AGC voltage increases, the gain of Q2 and Q3 goes down. Note that the detector diode is used both as an audio detector and AGC rectifier. The audio preamplifier. The audio preamplifier has a high impedance input. This provides a minimum load on the detector output. Refer to figure 22-45. Variable resistor R11 is used to select the detector signal at different voltage levels. The preamp gain varies. It is controlled by the negative feed or negative feedback from the audio amplifier through R20. See figure 22-46. The audio amplifier, the audio outputs from the detector, will have an amplitude of several volts. The impedance level will be fairly high. This means the, that line power will be available to drive the loudspeaker. In order to match the low impedance loudspeaker to the high impedance detector output, an audio amplifier with a low impedance output is required. In figure 22-46, transistors Q6, Q7, and Q8 do this. In the previous stage, transistor Q5 is biased, class A. It provides enough voltage and power gain to drive the output transistors Q7 and Q8. The output stage is composed of Q7, an NPN transistor, and Q6, a PNP transistor. During the positive swing, Q7 will conduct. During the negative swing, Q8 will conduct. It is crucial that Q8 and Q7 not be at the same time or not be on at the same time as this would cause a large current to flow through both transistors. Diode D2 prevents this event from occurring. It is best to use all of the voltage produced by the 9 volt battery. To accomplish this, the junction of the Q7 and Q8 emitter must not be allowed to idle at 4.5 volts. 
that is 9 volts divided 2, under no signal conditions. This error would make a peak-to-peak -peak audio signal of 9 volts ready for use before the signal is clipped. There is no signal voltage if there is no signal voltage centered at the halfway point, one side of the signal swing will clip at a lower voltage. This action causes uneven clipping distortion, which limits the ready to use power outputs. The audio amplifier in figure 22-46 achieves halfway idle bias voltage as follows. Transistor Q7 is, a, is an PNP device a positive voltage applied to its base applied to its base emitter junction will cause it to conduct resistors R6 and R7 excuse me R16 and R17 provide bias current that causes Q7 to turn on if no other circuit elements are present the bias current will cause the Q7 emitter to rise to 9 volts minus the collector emitter voltage drop. To prevent this, the emitter of Q7 is connected via R19 to the base of Q6. Q6 is also an NPN transistor. As a higher base current is applied to Q7, the collector emitter resistance becomes lower. The collector of Q6 is connected via R8 18 and D2 to the base of Q7. As Q6 becomes lower in resistance, it steals the base current from Q7. This increases the collector emitter resistance of Q7. The network then becomes a voltage divider. To complete the circuit, think of the effect of the PNP transistor Q8. If the base emitter junction of Q8 becomes forward biased, it will conduct. As stated earlier, it must not be allowed to conduct, to conduct at the same time as Q7. Under working conditions, capacitor C14 couples the audio signal to the base of driver inverter Q6. When the signal swings positive, Q6 will conduct more. As a result, Q8 will also conduct more. While this is happening, more current is stolen from the base of Q7 and Q7 conducts less. On the negative swing of the signal, Q6 will conduct less. This allows Q8 to reverse bias. More bias current is then applied to Q7, causing it to conduct more. As in many circuits, there are two conditions. These conditions are DC or no signal conditions and AC or dynamic conditions. In order to study the circuit, both states should be understood and then combined. Capacitor C17 is used to block DC current from flowing through the speaker. Alignment. The superheterodyne receiver contains several tuned circuits. These include the primary and secondary windings of the IF transformers. These must be tuned to resonance or maximum response for those signals to be passed. Variable trimmer capacitors are connected in parallel with these coils to provide the adjustments or alignment. Receivers often need adjustment as they age or after parts have been replaced in service shop in the service shop, peaking a receiver to adjust it is also known as aligning the receiver. Tools needed for peaking include a signal generator and an output indicator, such as an AC voltmeter. A signal generator produces either modulated or unmodulated RF wave, produces either a modulated or an unmodulated. RF wave. This can be selected by the controls on the panel. When an alignment job is needed, consult the technical manual for that radio or TV. IC radios, that's integrated circuit radios. 
Most electronics or mo most electronic parts of an AM FM radio can be contained on one IC chip. See figure 22-47. This is an excellent ex example of how micro circuits can reduce the size and cost and provide improved performance over a transistor radio. The AM FM IC contains most of the radio circuits active components. One of the interesting features of this integrated circuit is its ability to operate over a wide range of voltage supplies. Typically it can operate up to 13 volts DC and down to 2 volts DC. Today, variable capacitance diodes are used in place of the large bulky variable capacitors to tune radio circuits. A diode has a natural capacitance caused by the space between the anode and cathode. The construction is similar to the typical capacitor constructed with two plates separated by an insulator. The amount of voltage applied to the variable capacitance diode determines the amount of capacitance. The variable capacitance diode is also incorporated into certain ICs. Just as a quick interlude or sidebar, global positioning systems is the topic to discuss that relates to this chapter about AM and FM communications. Global positioning systems or GPS are, are space-based radio positioning systems that provide 24-hour three-dimensional position, velocity and time information to equipped users. The NAVSTAR system, operated by the United States Department of Defense, is the first global positioning system widely available to commercial enterprises and private citizens. GPS satellites orbit the Earth every 12 hours, emitting continuous navigation signals on two different L-band frequencies. With GPS receiver these signals can be used to calculate time to within a millionth of a second, velocity within a fraction of a mile per, per hour, and location within a few feet. The user does not need to transmit any or anything to the satellite, and the satellite is not aware of the user's presence. There's also no limit to the number of users that can be using the system at any one time. For greater security, multiple satellites are used simultaneously to receive data. An encoded military signal is first received for a minimum of four satellites. The time required for the signal to travel from the satellite to the designated location is then calculated by a computer system. After the distance from each satellite is calculated, the information is converted to latitude and longitude, longitude coordinates. Coordinates can also be converted into an image on a computer screen. This computer screen illustrates the local regional map and then displays the exact location on the screen display. In order to prevent the deciphering of security information, the military limits public access of GPS signals to course acquisition code, CA code. The CA code is less accurate, easier to jam, and easier to acquire. The precision code or P code is designed for authorized military users. To ensure that unauthorized users do not acquire the P code, an encryption segment called anti spoofing or AS can be implemented on the P code. GPS can be used to locate other sat satellites and for location systems of vehicles such as fleet, a fleet of trucks, ships and or air, airplanes. It can be used by weather bureaus to measure moisture contents in the atmosphere 
and by geologists to measure plate tectonics or movements of the Earth's crust. GPS receivers have been developed for use in aircraft, ships, land vehicles, and for hand carrying. Moving on to review questions for section 22.7. Question 1. Define heterodyning, and that is the conversion of signals to an intermediate frequency. Mixing several audio wave frequencies in a carrier wave. 2. How does the super heterodyne receiver differ from the TRF receiver. It does not require fine tuning. 3. The intermediate frequency at super heterodyne radio is 455 kHz. 4. What three functions are performed by the mixer? And that is that it mixes frequencies, converts signal to intermediate frequency and applies the or amplifies the signal. Question 5. A local oscillator produces an unmodulated signal of 455 kHz above the incoming frequency signal. 6. What is the purpose of the AGC circuit in a super heterodyne receiver? That is to regulate volume the signal. Excuse me, that is to regulate the volume automatically. 7. What tools are needed to align a receiver? That is a signal generator and an output indicator or a meter. Finally, question 8. The variable capacitor or the, the variable capacitance diode is replacing the variable capacitor that uti utilizes large plates separated by air. twenty two dot eight FM receiver. A block diagram of a complete FM receiver is shown in figure twenty two dot forty eight. Each block is labeled according to its function in the system. The FM receiver is similar to the super heterodyne AM receiver with three three exceptions. The incoming signal to be tuned are from eighty eight to one hundred and eight megahertz. The IF frequency used in the FM radio is 10.7 megahertz, though the same heterodyne principles apply as with the AM receiver. The detection method is used, or the detection method used in an FM receiver is different. FM detection. In the AM radio, the detector is sensitive to amplitude variations and FM detector must be sensitive to frequency variations and remove them from the FM wave. The FM detector must produce a varying amplitude audio signal from the frequency variations contained in the FM wave. Refer to figure 22.42-49. Assume that a circuit has a peak response at its resonant frequency. All frequencies other than resonance will have a lesser response. If the center frequency of an FM wave is on the slope of the resonant response curve, a higher frequency will produce a higher response in voltage. A lower frequency will produce a lower voltage response. The curve in figure 22-49 reveals that the amplitude of the output wave is the result of the maximum deviation of the FM signal. The frequency of the audio output depends on the rate of FM signal frequency change. Discriminator. 
The discriminator in the FM receiver takes the place of the detector in the AM receiver. It turns the frequency vari variations of the incoming wave into an audio signal. The discriminator in figure 22-50, top of the screen, uses three tuned circuits. In this circuit, L1, C1, is tuned to the center frequency. L2, C2 is tuned to the above center frequency. L3, C3 is tuned to the below center frequency by an equal amount. At center frequency, equal voltages are developed across the tuned circuits. D1 and D2 conduct equally. The voltages across R1 and R2 are equal and opposite in polarity. The circuit, the circuit output is zero. If the input frequency increases above center, L2, C2 develops a higher voltage then D1 conducts more than D2 and unequal voltages develop across R1 and R2. The difference between these voltage drops will be the audio signal. The output therefore is a voltage wave varying at the rate of frequency change at the input. Its amplitude depends upon the maximum deviation. The capacitors across the outputs of the discriminator filter out any remaining radio frequencies. The discriminator in figure 22-51 is a circuit encountered in some FM receivers. L1 and C1 are tuned to center frequency. At frequencies above resonance, the tuned circuit becomes more inductive. At frequencies below resonance, the circuit becomes more capacitive. The out-of-phase conditions produce voltages that determine which diode will conduct. The output is an audio wave. In advanced courses, you will study this type of detection in more detail. Note that each diode is the discriminator. In the discriminator, each diode in the discriminator must have equal conduction capabilities. This means that the semiconductor diodes used must be in matched pairs. Radio detector. Another type of FM detector is drawn in figure 22-52, bottom of your screen. It is called the radio detector. The diodes are connected in series with the tuned circuit. At center frequencies, both diodes conduct during half cycles. The voltage across R1 and R2 changes, changes C1 to the output voltage. Capacitor C1 remains charged because the time constant of C1R1 and R2 is no longer than the period of the incoming waves. C2 and C3 also ch charge to the voltage of C1. When both D1 and D2 are conducting equally, the charge of C2 equals C3. They form a voltage divider. At the, end, at the center point between C2 and C3, the voltage is zero. A frequency shift, either below or above center frequency, causes one diode to conduct more than the other. As a result, the voltages of C2 and C3 become unequal, but they will always total the voltage of C1. This change of voltage at the junction of C2 and C3 is the result of the ratio of the unequal division of charges between C2 and C3. This will vary at the same audio rates as the rate of change of the FM signal. Look again at the charge of C1. It is the result of the carrier wave amplitude or signal strength. It is charged by the half-wave rectification of the FM signal. It is therefore a fine point to pick off an automatic volume control voltage to feed back to previous stages to regulate stage gain. Noise limiting. FM radio receivers are sensitive to and detect frequency variations not amplitude variations. Most noise and interference in radio reception are amplitude variations. 
they are called noise spikes. Noise spikes have little effect on the FM detector, therefore FM reception is mostly free of noise and disturbances. The FM signal is held at a constant amplitude before detection in a discriminator circuit using a limiter. A schematic of a limiter stage is shown in figure 22-53. A limiter is an overdriven amplifier stage. If the incoming signal reaches a certain amplitude in voltage, it drives the transistor to cutoff or saturation when the voltage is opposite in polarity. At either, these, at either of these points, gain cannot be increased. The output is confined within these limits. Any noise spikes will be clipped off. Review questions for section 22.8. 1. Draw a block diagram of a FM receiver. That is shown on the screen. 2. What is the difference between detection methods in the AM receiver and the FM receiver? That is that AM re detectors are sensitive to amplitude variations. The FM receiver must be sensitive to frequency variation. 3. Most interferences in radio reception are amplitude variations called noise spikes. And four, the discriminator circuit in, a, in an FM receiver does not allow signals to go over a certain amplitude after they leave the IF transformer and reach the discriminator circuit. Speakers. A common type of speaker is shown in figure 22-54. The drawing diagramming the parts of the speaker appears in figure 2-55. It is made with a permanent magnet. It is called a PM speaker. A PM speaker, a strong magnetic field, is produced between the poles of a fixed permanent magnet. A small voice coil is hung in the air gap. It is attached to the speaker cone. The audio alternating currents are joined to the voice coil. The action between the fixed field and the moving field causes the voice coil to move back and forth. This motion also causes the speaker to cone, causes the speaker cone to move back and forth. Again, this motion also causes the speaker cone to move back and forth. The air pressure in the form of sound energy changes back and forth from highest to lowest pressure. The electrodynamic speaker replaces the permanent magnets with an electromagnet, figure 22-56. It works like the, PM, like the PM type. A strong source of direct current must be supplied to the electromagnet. This can come from the power supply. A common practice is to use the field coil of the speaker as the filter choke in the supply. Special sizes and types of speakers have been developed. These provide best responses for certain bands of audio frequencies. The low frequency speakers are woofers. High frequency speakers are called tweeters. A mid-range speaker can be used to reproduce intermediate frequencies. Special filters and crossover networks allow signals to set frequency ranges to be channeled to the speaker that best produces the sound. A crossover network is shown in figure 22-57. Coil L is connected to the subwoofer. Excuse me, coil L is connected to the woofer. As the frequency of the sound increases, the reactant the reactance of L increases at the rate of XL equals 2 pi frequency times uh, inductance or the formula for the equation for inductive reactance. The tweeter is connected through C. 
as the frequency increases, the reactance of C decreases at the rate of XC or inductive or capacitive reactance equals one divided by two pi FC. Values of L and C can be selected for the desired crossover point. This is usually between 400 and 1200 Hertz. Note that at one frequency, XL equals XC. The response is equal for both speakers at this crossover frequency. Headphones. Headphones provide excellent sound reproduction and allow for private listening. Like loudspeakers, there are two basic types of headphones, dynamic and electrostatic. See figure 22-58. Dynamic headphones are divided into two groups, pressure type and pressure type dynamic headphones, which require an air seal around the ears for proper bass or bass response. Figure 22-59. Hear through or velocity headphones allow the listener to hear outside sounds like telephone, uh, doorbells, etc. with the headphones in place. Pressure and hear through headphones use the same basic transducer. Some pressure headphones use a dynamic woofer and a separate tweeter. The tweeter can be electrostatic, ceramic, or dynamic in design. Correct crossover circuits are included in the headphone. Pressure and hear through headphones can have two or four channels. A copper voice coil is attached to the side of miniature loudspeaker cone or diaphragm. In quad headphones, there are two driver elements. Again, in quad headphones, there are two driver elements in each ear cup. The coil is hung in a magnetic field. It acts like a pulsating motor when the electrical form of the music energy flows through its windings. This causes the diaphragm to move the air in a manner similar to the original sound waves made by the musical instruments. See figure 22-60. Sound waves are made in headphones with either cone type or element type drivers. They both perform the same task. Cone type drivers are loudspeakers. They, like those found in small radios, they are not designed for headphone use, but they work well when used with the pressure type cushions. The element type drivers are special loudspeakers or loudspeaker structures. They're designed for headphone use. A special element is, is designed to work with certain headphone housing. Grouping the driver element and housing it into one package results in a driver that performs better and has better quality than the cone type drivers. Here through headphones are much different from the pressure type they are lightweights and have porous foam ear cushions. Recall that the pressure type headphone requires a closed volume of air. Hear through headphones, however, vent, back, vent the back sound waves through the rear of the cup. The porous cushion provide some acoustic resistance. They help control the sound emitted by the headphone diaphragm. They also provide some acoustic openness. This allows the listener to hear outside sounds when the headphones are in place. A key advantage of this headphone is its weight. The drawback, however, is a loss of sound quality. Dynamic headphones use a fairly heavy copper voice coil. It is attached to one side of a miniature loudspeaker cone. In theory, the moving parts act like a piston to reproduce the recorded sound, but the heavy voice coil lags behind the electrical energy. Therefore, the plastic or parchment cone also lo loses 
true piston action and distorts the sound wave. Electrostatic. Electro electrostatic headphones look like pressure type headphones, however, their mechanics are very different. The best electrostatic headphones use light diaphragms of plastic instead of heavy plastic or parchment cones. The diaphragm in electrostatic headphones may be only one one thousandth of an inch thick and weight less than the surrounding air. The diaphragm moves back and forth by controlled charges of static electricity. The lightness and control of the high quality electrostatic allows for excellent sound reproduction. See figure 22-61. Frequency response of electrostatics is wider and flatter than dynamics. Using electrostatic headphones makes the drawbacks of disc and tape recordings, power source equipment, and broadcast stations more apparent. The noise and hiss from these sources are more noticeable to the listener. Tone controls. Tone controls are used to adjust the amount of high or low frequencies sent out from speakers. Most radios, televisions, and audio amplifiers have these controls. One tone control circuit is shown in figure 22-62. Capacitor C1 has a low reactance for high audio frequencies. The value of C1 is usually 0.05 microfarad and R1 is 50,000 ohms. A tone switch with three control positions can also be used. The reactance of the capacitor for each position filters or removes the high frequencies. Figure 22-63 shows the tone switch control system with three capacitors of different values. Review questions for section 22.9. What is a transducer? It is a device that transforms electrical energy to sound and vice versa. Two, make a sketch showing the operating principles of the PM speaker. An attempt at that is shown on the screen. Low frequency speakers are called woofers, while high frequency speakers are called tweeters. Name three basic basic types of headphones, or name the basic types of headphones, and that is electrostatic and dynamic. Summary for the chapter is as follows. The basic radio receiver consists of an antenna, a ground, a tank circuit, a diode, a filter, and a speaker. A radio wave is an electrostatic radiation of energy produced by an oscillator circuit. Two types of transmitted waves are ground waves and sky waves. A ground wave follows the surface of the earth to the radio receiver and has three parts, the surface wave, the direct wave and the ground reflected wave. Radio waves travel at the speed of light, that is 186,000 miles per second or 300 million meters per second. The relationship between frequency and wavelength is noted in the equation shown at the bottom of the screen, that is the wavelength equals V for velocity divided by F for frequency. The basic transmitters include continuous wave, modulated wave, excuse me, modulated continuous wave, amplitude modulation, and frequency modulation. Some basic types of microphones are the carbon, dynamic, crystal, and velocity. Modulation is the process of adding or superimposing audio waves to carrier waves. Modulation percentages refer to the amount of the 
refer to the amount a carrier wave has been varied or modulated. Amplitude modulation is a process in which an audio wave is combined or superimposed on a carrier wave and the amplitude of the carrier wave is made to vary at the audio signal rate. With frequency modulation, a constant amplitude continuous wave is made to vary in frequency at the audio frequency rate. The tuned radio frequency or TRF receiver picks up a transmitted RF wave, amplifies it, detects or demodulates it, and amplifies the audio wave. High frequency rectification or high frequency rectification of the RF wave is called detection. The super heterodyne receiver converts the tuned RF signal to an intermediate frequency or IF signal so that this signal can be further amplified and refined. Sensitivity or selectivity, not sen sensitivity, selectivity is the ability of a receiver to select a single frequency and reject all others. That was selectivity. Sensitivity is the ability of a receiver to respond to weak incoming signals. That was sensitivity. Some common intermediate frequency signals are 455 kHz for AM and 10.7 MHz for FM. Transducers are devices that convert one form of energy to another. Some common transducers are microphones and speakers. Moving on to the test your knowledge section of this chapter. Question one, make a sketch showing the direction of travel of a wave transmitted from a horizontal antenna. An attempt at that is made top of your screen, right side. Question two, the signal created by an oscillator is A or N, and that is an alternating wave or AC wave, which is electromagnetic and electrostatic alternating wave. Three, what is the wavelength in meters of a signal with a 1200 kilohertz frequency? Using the equation where wavelength equals to your velocity divided your frequency, you ultimately get 250 meters. Question four, what are the standard frequencies for the following receivers? For AM, 500 to 1600 kilohertz. For FM, 88 to 108 megahertz. And for television receivers are 174 to 806 megahertz. Five, what is the purpose of the microphone? It is to turn sound wave into electrical signals. Six, fill in the blank. Modulation is a process in which an audio wave is superimposed on a carrier wave. Seven, what is the formula for computing percent of modulation? The formula is shown where percent of modulation equals to voltage maximum minus voltage minimum. Two, uh, that's all of that. All of that is divided by 2 voltage C or EC and all of that multiplied by 100. Question 8. What power is required to modulate a transmitter having a DC input of 250 watts to 50%? The formula is PN or PA equals 2.5 times 250 watts in this case. All that divided by 2 and we get 62.5 watts in this case. The amplitude, that's question 
9, the amplitude of a modulating signal has a maximum deviation of 15 kilohertz and a frequency of 1500 hertz. What is the modulation index? And in this case, we simply divide 15 by 1500, and that is 0 0.01, which is the modulation index. Question 10. The process of removing the audio wave from the modulated RF wave is, correct answer is C, both of the above, the modulation and detection. Question 11. What two characteristics determine the quality of a tuning circuit? That is selectivity and sensitivity. 12. A band switching circuit changes the resonant frequency chain range of a circuit. 13. The RF amplifier. Complete the answer and the, qu and the answer is all of the above. As a complete statement, the RF amplifier is the first stage that the received signal is fed to from the antenna and provides amplification of the incoming to the incoming signal and finally improves the selectivity of the receiver of, of a receiver. Question 14. Sketch a block diagram of, of a superheterodyne receiver. An attempt at that was made and is shown on the screen. Question 16. An automatic gain control. No. Question 15. What is the advantage of a separate local oscillator attached to a mixer that is a more stable design and less distortion? with less distortion. Question 16, automatic gain control, that is fill in the blank, that's the answer, automatic gain constro control or AGC, automatically adjusts all volume levels to a constant level. Question 17, what is the purpose of alignment? And that is to service receivers. Question 18, what na name two types of FM detectors? That is the discriminator, radio, radio and the radio detector. Discriminator and ratio detector. 19, explain the operation of a PM speaker. For a PM speaker, a strong magnetic field is produced between the poles of a fixed permanent magnet. A small voice coil is hung in the air cap and it is attached to the speaker cone. The audio altern alternating currents are joined to the voice coil. The action between the fixed field and the moving field causes the voice coil to move back and forth. This motion also causes the speaker cone to move back and forth. The air pressure in the form of sound energy changes back and forth from highest to lowest pressure. That is the basic operation of a PM speaker. Question 20 and the last question for this chapter. What is the purpose of the tone control? And that is to adjust the amount of high and low frequencies from the speakers. And these are some of the projects involved with this chapter. There are many. The author was apparently very fond of AM and FM radio communications and they decided to do a whole bunch of projects dealing with radio some of them may be quite interesting and to repeat some of them could be quite interesting and they could be a very educational and uh, rich experience for many of you i invite you to review these pause the video as needed 
and write down directions, instructions, step by step, uh, on how to do and perform these experiments. I will share. So we'll go through these, perform them, build them as much as you can, get as far as you can if you get stuck, review the material, and search for further information with other sources, and good luck with all of these experiments. Congratulations, you have completed this very thorough and encompassing chapter. Very important and lengthy and information full chapter on AM and FM radio communications. You have earned the advanced rank, the advanced electronics course rank of Colonel 011. Thank you very much. And please do continue your studies and experiments. Thank you very much.